a happy Sabbath and happy day. Uh, we are so grateful to God who has given us an opportunity uh, for another day so that we can study and continue studying from his word. And from our viewers online and those who are already in the church, we welcome you to our lesson study for today. And we pray that we will be blessed together as, as we, we begin. Just before we pray, I need to introduce those who are up front with me. And from my right, we have our brother. Uh, you will greet us and tell us your name. Happy Sabbath. Uh, my name is Eduardo Irere. Uh, thank you. Happy Sabbath. My name is Shaquille Quincy. Thank you. And this other side. Happy Sabbath. My name is Sarah Oswago. Thank you, Sarah Achieng Oswago, for uh, being present. Uh, Edward and uh, Shaquille. As we start, uh, my name is uh, Philip uh, Zef. Uh, we pray to start. Our Father, we thank you for this other day that you have given to us. As we study from your word, I pray that, Lord, you will teach us your will and you will anchor our hopes in Christ Jesus, who is coming again to take us. Now may your blessings be with us as we start this study today, for we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, our lesson today is an exciting one, and I want to welcome you as we start uh, this day. And uh, our study is entitled, Jesus, the Anchor of the Soul. That is already a hope given to all of us as we wait for soon return of Christ. Now, our key text is a very beautiful text that comes from the book of Hebrews chapter 6, 19 and verse 20. And it says that this hope we have is an anchor in the soul, both secure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil, where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus having become a high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. In that text alone, uh, we find that Christ is already bringing hope to us or Paul is trying to bring hope to us as we see or as we look forward to the coming of Christ Jesus and last week and other days that have passed we have been talking about Christ as our high priest one who saves us one who is interceding for us one who is before the father to speak on our behalf and Paul is interjecting today that as we are starting so on on on, on this other day you realize that there are many people who have been called into faith and um, they have been in the church, they have been in the service, they have been part and parcel of the evangelistic missions, they have been doing everything that pertains to, to the work and the service of God. But in one way or another, there is a point in which they have backslidden. And uh, Paul has come today to really tell us, you know, there is a hope, and that hope is in Christ Jesus. There is hope that, we, that Jesus is coming again. There is hope that this Christ is the one that saves us. But before then, some people have backslidden. And so today we are already talking about God's warnings uh, through Paul to us in these very last days that we cannot give up at this very time. So Sarah, Sarah I want just to start with you. There are these warnings that Paul is talking about uh, which one do you do you remember? Paul is talking about from the book. We are studying from the book of uh, Hebrews chapter 5 verse 11 down to chapter 6 and verse 20. That is where our study is based today. So you are welcome to study with us. Yes, Sarah. Uh, some of the warnings that Paul is really warning us of is the danger of falling away once you become a Christian due to the challenges that we face. And as you look at the book of Hebrews, we realize that Paul is worried uh, because most people are uh, about to fall away and they are yet to fall away from Christ. And we realize that Paul acknowledged that sometimes difficult situations may dull our spiritual senses by first making us faithless. And this may make us also, also to stop growing our understanding and experiencing the gospel. And this is a potential danger for all of us that we may, because we may get discouraged 
and after being discouraged we may um because of our trials we may be led away from the anchor of our soul and so what we are really uh, being called now what Paul encourages us and the lesson writer encourages us to do is to try and taste the goodness of the word mm -hmm. so that we, uh, we are not left vulnerable but to, uh, we are held and firmly rooted in the anchor of the soul who is Christ Jesus our Lord. And yes so as we as we, as we get to test the goodness of the word you know at times we may really ask is this word really good and before you know the goodness of something you must first miss it it has you, you, you have to have no idea of of its goodness or it somehow has not to be there in a way yet it is there for example, if the word was not there, then it will just be normal. People, like the way in some cultures it was okay for somebody's uh, wife to be inherited with, uh, uh, by another husband in his absentia. And so you realize that there are things that, there are practices that we practiced before being enlightened by the word that the word has really saved us and that is why we say that this word is good. And as we read from the book of uh, as we read from the book of uh, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 4 and 5 says, But fornication and uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be named among you as become its saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know that no womonga nor unclean person nor covetous person who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. And so uh, the goodness of the word and what is able to save us from Paul's situation, or Paul's worry of us drifting away is testing the goodness of the Lord and being enlightened by the word of God and being delivered from it. Imagine in a situation whereby uh, we will still be, uh, there was no message, the gospel message being spread to where we come from. We will still be afraid of going home because we, uh, people will envy us because of our wealth and kill us along the way. But right now we feel safe going home knowing that people have been enlightened and you feel safe staying next to a brethren that you don't know how they have been in the course of the week by faith that they are children of God and you feel that your things are secure with them if you can leave the church fellowship and just walk out and come back in faith that your things are good and that salvation is only given by Christ Jesus our Lord he enlightens us and delivers us from our, our practices uh, our sinful practices that easily beset us and the another goodness of the, uh, of, the, of, the of the word is that it gives us a happy family. There is this friend of mine who was telling me, if you don't want to be saved for your own sake, just get sake for the, uh, saved for the sake of people who are living around you. For the sake of your mother who has bought a television and when you are not saved and you are in alcoholism, you can come and sell this, this television. That you, Even the, 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 the cooking stick in your house is not safe when you are not saved. And so this is what the goodness of the word of the Lord uh, brings to us that we are saved to a point even the gods know that we are safe in the hands of a saved man. Amen. That is quite challenging. And you know, uh, uh, the people of God, it is important that you also realize that when, uh, now the one, one warning when, when the Bible says, you know, God declares us and says that you are a royal priesthood, a holy people. People whom he, have call, he has called from darkness into his marvelous light. Amen. Now that you may show forth the praises of him who has saved you. Now look at this situation. God has entrusted you with the light that he's put in you. God has saved you and he's given you everything that you need to do. But you realize that you are already uh, getting back. You are getting weak. You are already falling away. You are choosing not to do that which is right. Uh, uh, Brother Eddie, uh, may you please uh, tell me now that if you choose not to do or if you choose to walk away you once, who was once in the fold, you who was once mm, uh, active, you was once enlightened and you are very active in the service of God. Today you've chosen not to continue. What is the repercussion? Because there is something. God is probably still warning us and we must be very careful about it. Yes. 
Yeah, so um, I will echo back um, one of the verses that we've read. That is Hebrews 6, 4 to 6, um, which says, For it is impossible for those who are once enlightened and have tasted the he heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come. If they fall away, to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. Sometimes we always have a um, couple of questions of um, whether there is any hope when we have um, sinned against God, if God is able to restore us um, back to our former ways, that is when we used to be partakers of the Holy Spirit. Um, the verses, uh, Paul is talking about something very sensitive here. The verses here in Hebrews are very strong. And at first glance from the title of, the, um, of this, we can see that it's impossible. It says impossible to restore. Now, the point Hebrews is making here is not that it's impossible to restore for, for us to be forgiven when we have fallen or we have sinned against God. The actual point or the main point is actually that it's impossible for us to be forgiven if we turn away from the Holy Spirit, if we turn away from the grace uh, of God, from tasting the goodness of God. Now, one of the sections uh, that we're reading today um, says that to crucify again the Son of God, um, which is in Hebrews 6, 6, to crucify again the Son of God is, um, is a figurative expression. Technically, it talks about the personal relationship that we have um, with God, me and God, you and God. And um, when Paul suggests that we are crucifying the Son of God, he talks about the relationship that we have. So as individuals, when we have um, a faulty relationship with God, then we find that we are crucifying the Son of God. As we continue, we can see um, something that happened before about um, the religious leaders who crucified Jesus. Um, and technically to them, Jesus posed a very great threat to, to them, you know, to their supremacy and their autonomy. Um, so they did plan to get rid of Jesus, um, which they did. Um, but Paul suggests that in the same way that they did, the gospel um, challenges as, as individuals to actually um, challenges the sovereignty of and self-determination of an individual at the fundamental level. The fundamental level, technically, we're talking about the passions and desires of each individual. So the gospel challenges those uh, specifics, the passions and, and the desires. So um, to us, what it will mean is we need to crucify the world, you know, just like, um, and also the flesh, just like, um, you know, the, the religious leaders um, decided to crucify Jesus because he was a threat. The same way the world, the flesh, is also a threat to us. And the gospel, the main aim of the gospel is actually to crucify these things. Um, so, um, the final uh, thing that we need to also uh, look at is the struggle between Jesus and self. So we've seen that uh, we do struggle with flesh and um, we do struggle with the world, all the ambitions in the world and everything. But we also look at um, the struggle between Jesus and self. And Paul puts it in Romans 8 and 7, Galatians 5, 17, that it's actually a struggle to the death. And it's a very difficult battle um, that is not won at, uh, only once, but it's always won every day. And Paul uh, suggests that um, it's something we need to be renewed each and every day. It's not um, just a gradual transformation that we get from, um, you know, just praying once and everything is done. Every single day we have to be renewed. Um, and that's what we are finding from Romans 8, 7 and Galatians 5, 17. And um, as long as the person does not fully choose to turn away from um, uh, from sin and let's note this 
as long as the person does not fully choose to turn away from Christ, there is still the hope of salvation. So we need to note that um, the battle of self is won um, while kneeling down. We have to come to God. We have to um, accept his, um, his merits and his righteousness. And we'll, we'll still have hope for salvation. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, my brother Edward. You know the Bible. The Bible is a very beautiful uh, message to us. Now, Paul was writing to, to these people whom he, he always interacted with and warning them. Sometimes he visited and they were getting tired of, the, of what they were doing. Sometimes they missed Sabbath. Sabbath days. Sometimes they were not coming for, if they were choir members, they stopped coming for choir practice. And Paul, Paul is really trying to encourage them in this very last, or his final moments. And even in these last days, he's really talking to us to tell us that, you know, uh, we cannot continue in sin. And we cannot continue feeding the flesh. Let me put it in quote. Feeding the flesh, that is feeding self. We, we really need to feed uh, Christ in us so that he may overweigh the sins that are, that are easily besetting us. So Paul, Paul, is, Paul is, really, is really telling us, you know, when we continue anchoring ourselves on the things of this flesh, of which again John says that the lust of the flesh, these are not of the Father. But when we put ourselves unto God, then it becomes an easy way of us to survive. So there is another warning that Christ has given us, or Paul has given us, that is, we must be very careful. Because while we continue or going back to the sinful lives that we once forsook, then something is very important that you need to realize is that you're crucifying Christ for the second time. But you know you need to understand that there is no more sacrifice left. There is no more sacrifice left for our sins. And, 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 and Paul is really encouraging us, and I would want to hear from, uh, from uh, Shaquille. Uh, Paul, Paul is again telling us that, you know, well, yes, Christ is somewhere in the, is, is really in the, is, is in the high places or is in the right side or hand of God. They are uh, pleading for us, speaking on our behalf so that we may be forgiven. But that those who are taking it for granted, they still think they have time to do certain things. But Christ is saying, or Paul is saying, there is no more sacrifice. That is as written in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse number 26. There is no more sacrifice. Why? Okay, there is no more sacrifice in that God pro God gave us Jesus as an advocate for us. Mm -hmm. And for this one, it is through Jesus that we get the forgiveness of sin. And uh, this one we find in uh, 1 John, uh, uh, 1 John chapter 1, verses 9, that if we confess our sins mm -hmm. so that we be cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ, uh, uh, no matter how deep we are into sin, it is only through Jesus' blood, only through him that we can be cleansed. So there is no sacrifice left. No matter what we do, no matter how deep we are into sin, we should always turn to Jesus because he was only the sacrifice from God. Amen. It means there is no other sacrifice God is going to give for you and for me. Jesus was given once and is not going to be given again. Sarah, yes. there is no more sacrifice left for our sins. You know, that's an interesting point in that uh, the, the reason why most of us remain in our sinful habit is because the devil always tells us, after good someone has come here and you are yet to make a decision and you say, uh, I'm not going to do it uh, anymore and then the devil tells you just this one last time just do it for the if it's alcohol just drink it so that you just forget it go do your best so that you leave it and you realize that even many all companies and organizations didn't rise up in one day there was a progression to it uh, uh, the danger of drifting away uh, once you have received light is that uh, if Christ's blood can save you, then there is no any other. There is no any other means we can use to get you to the the other side. And so uh, you realize that if you you take for granted the sacrifice that God offered through His Son, there is no more sacrifice left for your acts. 
there is nothing we can do. And you, you, we often come to situations after someone uh, has really uh, messed us really up or messed it up to the end. And we start recalling how we tried our best to save our brother. And the same situation applies to us in our Christian life. That be warned. The moment you start compromising a little, compromising this day, compromising tomorrow, and little by little you will find that it will be hard for you to come back. But when we believe in the ultimate sacrifice, which is the blood of the Lamb, then that is the only sacrifice that can remedy our sinful illness. Thank you. Thank you. There is that ultimate sacrifice, that blood is still fresh. There is that songwriter that says the blood of Jesus that was shed on Calvary has never lost its power. It is still powerful to date. Uh, Eddie, Eddie, uh, there is no more sacrifice, you know. We are continuing to get back to our old ways. We were once here active members. Uh, you see, there are these people who are saying, <laughs> you know, we are the people who started this thing. We are the people who started this church. And so they have given up. They don't know they are falling away. What do you have to tell them? There is no more sacrifice left. The way Sarah puts it, the, the hardening of the heart is not something that just happen gradually sorry um, it's some it's a progression yeah it's the small things that we actually um, get involved in that actually um, you know hardens the heart but what does it what does it mean to actually harden the heart um, Hebrews chapter 9 15 to 22 talks about Paul's put puts it um, using very strong words and one of the expressions that he uses is to profane the blood of the covenant. He also uses the words like insulting the spirit of grace and talks about arrogance and insolence. So as we look into this, we can see that um, to profane the blood of the covenant, you know, to harden your heart, to actually, um, you know, get to a point where you, there's no sacrifice for, uh, you know, for the sins left. It means to actually um, reject Jesus' sacrifice. You know, the blood that was shed um, um, at Calvary, we have actually, we don't want to do, we don't want any part with it as, as sinners. And also we, we look at um, the insulting of the spirit of grace. The, the lesson says, the Greek terms, um, enibrisos, insult or outrage, involves the manifestation of hubris, which refers to insolence or arrogance. This term stands in stark contrast to the description of the Holy Spirit, that is the spirit of grace. It's actually the opposite of the spirit of grace. If you insult the spirit of grace, that would mean that you don't want anything to do with the grace given to uh, with, with God. And it implies also that the apostate has responded to God's offer of grace with an insult. You know, um, we've been given Jesus Christ, the Son of God, but as a sinner we just decide to, you know, we're like, I don't think this is enough. Yeah, um, You just decide to go your own way. So if you go beyond that, there will be no sacrifice left. There is no other thing that can be done um, for us to be saved. We need to just stay there. Um, at Jesus' feet and accept the sacrifice given to us, accept the grace of God and become partakers of the Holy Spirit. So much, uh, 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 online viewers, we still welcome you. If you have questions, please uh, just send them in. Uh, they will be answered as we progress. And uh, we really thank God that we have this time to be warned. Many people do not have these occasions where uh, they even study the word of God to be warned. We cannot continue in sin because God has decided to send his son to die for us. We cannot continue to go back to where we have come from. That means there is no salvation and I think in physics that would be there is no work done. But God has done his best uh, for us to really be saved, for us to really be called his own. 
he has done it all. And that is why, uh, as we were studying earlier on in the lesson, we must realize that the Bible says that when you hear this voice today, harden not your heart because you do not know what the next minute holds for you. And you may have gone until there is no return for you. I know sometimes the devil speaks to you like Sarah has said, that you, you, you get yourself doing things, just do it one more time. These little, little things that we continue to do in the name of it is just this once. You may do it just this once, but it will be just that once and you are lost forever. Oh, God is really warning us and we really need to have hope in him. And that's why he tells us, or Paul continues to tell us, that after knowing that there is no sacrifice left for us or for the sins that we commit, having known that if we are not careful, even our sins will not be forgiven, having known and being reminded that we were once enlightened of the word of God, simply to mean we have to keep the faith now onwards as we wait for the soon return. And as we continue to study, we are getting to learn that we must be patient here and, and the Bible says here is the patience of they that have the faith of Jesus and keep his commandments. You people, the Bible is full and rich of words that are needy, we need to be encouraged. And so Christ, or Paul still reminds us, and I need to tell you these three things. Paul says this, that God is not unrighteous, that he may forget the very good work or the love of the work that we did for our brethren. In other words, Paul, Paul is trying to tell us God has not forgotten. And if we, need, if, we, we, if we have to forget, then can you remember Hezekiah? At one point, even when his life was now about to be terminated or he was supposed to die, he went to God and told him, remember the works or the things that I have done for your cause. God is trying to tell us, or Paul is trying to tell us, God is never forgetful of the good things we have done. And so he says, that we must continue in doing these good works, that we should be saved. These good works are not only for our salvation, but they are for the salvation of others who have not known Christ. Two, Paul is telling us that we must be diligent to the end. And I love how John says it, that those who continue in this truth or continue in this faith unto the end, enduring all the pain, the things, the rejections, the frustrations of this life, there is a crown of life for you. And so Paul is telling us, be diligent as you do this work. Christ is really waiting for you. Do not give up. And you know, he says, one thing I remember the Bible says, is that he said, I will not leave you like orphans, but I will send a helper. And that is the Holy Spirit. And God has, in, in other words, God himself has come to help us through our situation. We are, only, we, we are not to look back. And finally, Christ is reminding us that we cannot be slothful. I have been reading, as I have been saying these words, I am reading Hebrews chapter 6 from verse 9, 10, 11. And I'm stopping at verse 12. And he says in verse 12 that we cannot be slothful workers. We only have but a short time before Christ comes again. And every one of us has been given a work. And Paul or John is trying to remind me that, you know, Christ is coming to reward each one of us according to what he has done. What have you done? You are given the opportunity to do certain things. You are given the talent to use it for the glory of God. You are given uh, a space. You are given a department to lead or to work there. But you have become slothful. Paul is reminding us that uh, this is not the time to be slothful. Paul is reminding us this is not the time to stop whatever we have been doing for the sake of other salvation. Paul is reminding us that if there is a time we should have not given up, then it is now. As a people, our faith encourages others. Our faith, our patience, our diligence, and our obedience to the work and the word of God, to the commandments of God, to the letter, will help us be saved. But I know it is not easy to do it on our own self. And so that is why Eddie said that we must now let self die and let Christ live in us. In other words, God has extended his hand to us so that we may be saved, so, us, so that we can walk safely through the challenges. They are there. But he says, keep focusing on Christ while the time goes. And while we think about these things, 
we have the blessed hope that Jesus is the anchor of each one of us, only if we choose to. Uh, Quincy, or oh, I call you Shakila. <laughs> we are talking about Jesus, the anchor of our hope, or our souls. He is the hope of our salvation. And having been warned, there is now the promise of this hope. What have you to say about uh, our anchor, or Jesus as our anchor, as we wait to see him a second time? The first way is with an oath which he made to Abraham and David. And we also see in the book of Exodus 32, where Moses is referring back to the oath when the people of Israel turned, uh, uh, turned their back from God. Why? Because they worshipped the golden calf. But the same, same, same God who, who was filled with anger and was fierce, who wanted to bring disaster to the people of Israel, after Moses uh, uh, seeking the face of the Lord for forgiveness, we see God is relenting his disaster back. And why? Remember, these people are, these people have, uh, uh, in, uh, before we reach that part where God, Moses is interceding for the, for the people of Israel, we see that God is calling the people of Israel as the stiff-necked people. Mm? They are stiff-necked. And he, he becomes, he cools his temper. Our God is a gracious God. He's a merciful God. He, he, then how? Also, as we should also seek for these promises. We should also refer back to them, not only when we are in trouble, but also when we need them. We may not need only the promises when we are, when we are in trouble, but we, we, may need it. we may need them for other people. And the same, same uh, uh, God uh, guaranteed his promise by, uh, uh, by seating Jesus at his right hand. The ascension of Jesus in heaven uh, uh, serves a purpose in, in uh, corroborating the fact that Jesus is the forerunner for Christians, for believers. What the, and then this sitting of Jesus as the forerunner, is, it, it acts as an anchor to us. Jesus is the anchor to us who is seated with God on his throne. Well, who is seated with God in our throne, in his throne. Yes, what, are, what other thing do we need? What other assurance do we need? Because we, we already have Jesus as our, as an, our anchor. Nothing, no matter how deep you are into sin, but if we hold on to Jesus, and that's why we, we surely pray and we, we, we end our prayer in Jesus' holy name, because he is the advocate. He is the one who connects us with, with, with God. We believe in him. He washed away our sins. So it is only him and through him that we are saved. Amen. Yeah. I love, I love, I love that bit. But before I speak about it, Sarah, Sarah, I know Jesus has been your anchor. And you can attest to this even by singing, Will your anchor hold in the storms of life? Amen. Yes. Amen. That, that's, that's a deep question. Uh, Hebrews, Hebrews 7, 7, 26 and 27 says, For such an high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, and defiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily, uh, uh, needeth not daily as those high priests to offer, to offer up sacrifice first for his own sins, and then for the peoples for this he did once when he offered up himself you know uh, I'm just trying to imagine uh, how chaotic it would have been if Jesus had to come every year to this world and just die for our sins of, or if Jesus didn't die, come and die you know salvation would be very expensive all of us I know right now a few of us only owns even uh, lamps or goats but every sin you have to look for a, a blameless lamb. 
and then look for a service uh, fee f to fly to Jerusalem and then go look for a priest that can help you uh, uh, seek for forgiveness and then this priest now has also to offer sacrifice on on his stead and that is that is a deep question that is a deep thought to me that the blessed hope is that my anchor holds uh, uh, and he keeps uh, he keeps us there and he is he's this person who even when things are so tough he just smiles and he just waits for you to complain complain and the devil thinks that when the devil thinks that now he's winning he just appears and everything else behaves and this is the blessed hope that we have that as we struggle as we as Paul is worried that we might drift away because of daily tribulations such as sickness and unbelief may uh, catch us up in our way there is hope in Christ that he is able to hold us the way he held Elijah, the mighty prophet who was scared by a woman and he was riding and leaving even his servant. And then Christ comes and meets him along the way and feeds him with food and gives him assurance that he is indeed going to defeat the enemy. And that is a blessed hope that he not only defeated the devil in heaven, he not only defeated him at the cross, he defeats him daily in our lives. And we wait for that, we await for that grand defeat when he, he, he will be ascending on that resurrection morning. Amen. Amen. Just, I want us to pick our last point because um, there is a blessed hope for each one of us. I know there is something you can tell us about what you, why Christ becomes the anchor of your soul in this day and in the days to come going to borrow this from John's example and um, in from Ellen's White, one of the books uh, that steps to Christ, this is what he, uh, she says, the warfare against self is the greatest battle that was ever fought. The yielding of the self, surrendering all to the will of God, requires a struggle. But the soul must submit to God before it can be renewed in holiness. And it continues with John's example. Now John was the youngest of the of the disciples and says John desired to become like Jesus and under the transforming influence of the love of Christ he did become meek and lowly self was hid in Jesus above all his companions John yielded himself to the power of that wondrous love and um, you know me you uh, you know our viewers we can draw an example from John you know John John decided to to let the power of Jesus transform him you could see how self was hid, and he came to become like uh, Jesus. And you can you, you can continue reading um, in, uh, f in uh, from Acts of Apostles um, about the story of John, which is a very beautiful story of how he came to really accept Jesus as the anchor of his soul. And um, you know, as as Eddie, I'm going to draw the example from John too. You know, to accept Jesus as my anchor of the soul and also to depend on him for every single thing that I do in life. Jesus is the anchor of our souls. Shaquille, I'm picking your last point. What encourages you of Christ being our forerunner, of him being there for us before God, pleading on our behalf? Song that actually encourages me a lot. What can wash away my sins? Mm -hmm. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Amen. What can make me clean? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Amen. So it is only the blood of Jesus who was given to us as the forerunner by God, who was given to us to die for our sins. Mm -hmm. What a blessing. Amen. Amen. Sarah, I want to give you one last minute. I want to give you one last minute, as you do for me, a summary of all this that we have said today. Uh, what we have just shared at the feet of Jesus is that uh, we have an anchor that keeps the soul, and once you are willing to follow him, he will, he will be there to help you. And... 
the, the whole the whole uh, lesson is summarized in our song will your anchor hold in the storms of life mm. and then the second stanza says it will surely hold though the storms uh, uh, withstand and then uh, let me let me just end because it is one minute let me just end with the fi the final stanza that when our eyes behold in the dawning light mm. shining gates of pearl our harbor bright we shall anchor fast to the heavenly shore with the storms all past forevermore amen dear viewer and believers what a hope that we have what an anchor in our lives in these days jesus speaks to his disciples before he leaves or in preparation to his ascension he tells them you know what be ready for persecution and it's going to be there for you. Just like I am going to be persecuted, you shall be persecuted. Jesus is speaking to them and continuing to give them the hope and telling them the events of life they are going to go through. He's telling them never to fear. There are sometimes they were going to sleep hungry, but that was not an option for them to stop believing in Christ. Child of God, there are points in which they even lacked a place to put their heads. But still, that was not a, a reason for them to stop trusting in Christ. Jesus, our forerunner, uh, the songwriter says that he has walked the way or he has trod the way before us. And I will gladly follow him. Will you follow Christ? Will you walk with him? Yes, there are challenges. Yes, there are things that bedevil us on this walk as we, we, we are headed home. Please do not look up to your sides. Paul encourages us as he finishes his work and says that he has finished the work. He has kept the faith. One important thing that I love with Paul in his statements, he says, There is a crown that is laid up for me. But not to me alone. But to all who have loved the appearing of the Lord. And that is Jesus Christ when he comes a second time. While he is still pleading on your behalf, you cannot stop at your sides. You cannot stop your walk today. Please walk on as we wait for his soon return. Please call your neighbors that there is a Christ who's, who, in our, who in him our hope is anchored. Do not look your sides. Please walk on as we wait for the soon return. May God bless you. Together with me was Sarah, Shakila, and Edward. My name is Philip. May God bless you until we meet another day, another Sabbath, to have these discussions in Jesus' name. Sarah, please pray with us. Our eternal Master in heaven, Lord, we thank you for this blessed Sabbath morning. We thank you for the blessed hope that in as much as we go through trials and tribulations, in as much as sin so easily beset us, in as much as we strive with fornication, and in as much as we are almost discouraged. You are the anchor that keeps our soul. And Lord, thank you for the uh, blessed assurance that you are ours and the blessed hope of your soon return to take us home. I thank you for the assurance that soon all this will come to an end and we shall sit face to face with our Savior just to uh, tell him of how it was uh, imagining and believing that we shall soon see him. Lord, I pray that may you prepare our hearts day by day and with each passing moment that we may be prepared to meet you in the air. I pray that you be with us this blessed Sabbath day. May we experience you in every session. And Lord, may we meet you in this date, uh, holy date with you. Guide our hearts and our steps. Even whatever we will say in our interactions today, Lord, I pray that may it be a blessing to the person we will say it to. I pray that you be with us now and as you prepare us for that uh, glad day that we shall soon be together, not to pray but to see you face to face and just talk to you, Lord. Thank you for this is our humble prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.